Well, it's nice to be with you again this evening and to share with you uh, from the Word of God. And thank you for your kind welcome as well. Uh, I'm going to read this evening from Hebrews chapter 11, a well-known chapter about faith. And we'll read uh, verses 1 and 2 to begin with, and then uh, the section about Moses. So Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded his grace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. We're going to consider uh, faith in the life of Moses and I'm going to do that to help us uh, this week and uh, our lives uh, here. I always think when we have the breaking bread, when we have the communion service, we're, we're making a number of statements. And uh, one statement is that we show forth the Lord's death. So we're making a declaration that Jesus has died and that he bore our sins. We show forth his death. So it's a public thing. It's a witness. It's a statement. Uh, we have these physical uh, emblems of bread and wine, and we're making that statement that Jesus has died. Then we're also making a statement that we remember him until he comes. And there's another statement, Jesus is coming back. So we look back to his death, and we look forward to his coming again. Now, I would think that uh, none of us here have seen Jesus physically. We've not seen him. And yet every, every week we come and we remember him and we speak about his coming again. And so in this amazing period of his absence, which has been a long time, 2,000 years uh, or thereabouts, uh, between his death and his coming again, we are living, confiding in somebody that we have never seen. Now, what is that? Well, it's faith. That's how we live. We live by faith and not by sight. That doesn't mean that we don't have many encouragements um, along the way. Um, and we do, and we have fellowship with one another, and we have seen the great things that God has done, but we've never seen Jesus, and so we live by faith. So faith is fundamental uh, to the Christian's life in this world. It's fundamental to how we live and how we move. And of course, uh, there is a time coming, possibly soon, I don't know, uh, when faith will give place to sight and you won't need faith in heaven, don't need faith in heaven, because we will see him as he is. And uh, John's epistle says that when we see him, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Isn't that amazing? So all those uh, shortcomings and failings and things that trouble us here, all gone, because we'll see him face to face and we'll be like him. So amazing. What a prospect the Christian has. So the world's not in great shape. Um, it's full of tension and trouble. But uh, we have in our hearts the hope of Jesus coming again. And when we see him, we'll be like him, or we shall see him as he is. Now, so considering this passage, uh, I, I read an article recently in, in a paper. It was an article about the Quakers, um, a very influential group started by George Fox uh, quite a few hundred years ago, and uh, still small groups meeting today. And the article was not in any way critical of the Christian faith, but there was a, a phrase in it that, that stayed with me. And uh, it, uh, it made me think of it, actually. And so what it did was it contrasted the searching of the Quakers. Quakers are people who are always searching for the good within, or searching and searching and seeking to find something. Uh, so the searching of the Quakers with the uh, ritual 
of the liturgical churches, possibly the Roman Catholic Church or the um, High Church of England type churches. So the ritual of that, and it contrasted those two things with the confidence of the evangelicals. And I was a bit, uh, maybe a bit spooked by that. Uh, we would say that we are evangelical Christians, that is to say we believe the gospel of God's grace. We sang about it um, in our communion service. And so the searching of one group with the ritual of the liturgical churches and the confidence of the evangelicals. Well, are we confident? Are we confident? Uh, we're not arrogant, I hope. I hope we're humble. I hope that we are uh, taking no ground because we are sinners saved by God's grace. But we're confident. And Paul could say, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So we're a confident people but a humble people. And so we live by faith, and we are sure, as we read in verse 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, some people, and I'm sympathetic with this, uh, there's quite an interest in spirituality, not necessarily Christianity, but spirituality, and some people would say, I don't know where I'd be without my faith. Well, faith, I think, biblical faith, has to have an object. And the great introduction uh, to the Christian gospel is described as this, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God, we're sorry for our sins, and faith in someone outside ourselves altogether. So we don't look within, we look outside. We look to where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and we have faith in him. And I can tell you, I have staked everything, my eternal destiny, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And that's a testimony. If it's wrong, well, I am doomed because I've staked everything on it. Nothing else uh, matters except that Christ is the object of my faith. And that's true of every believer. But as we live our lives in the time between uh, Jesus uh, died and rose again and went back to heaven and his coming again, we live by faith, and God has asked us to live in the absence of sight. He says, no, I want you to live by faith. And so as we look at the uh, little summary of the life of Moses, and Hebrews is very helpful. Uh, unfortunately, it's one of these books that's very hard to understand unless you know the whole of the Old Testament. So it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a challenge. But uh, we have a beautiful New Testament commentary on the Old Testament scriptures and we learn things in Hebrews that you don't learn in the Old Testament. And so here we have the life of Moses uh, just in five verses. Now, Moses, of course, wrote um, uh, the first five books of the Bible are called the books of Moses. And so there's a lot on those. And here we have five verses about Moses. And from each of these five verses, I want to take one word. So the life of Moses in five words, um, not insulting it, I don't think. But the Bible gives us this wonderful uh, summary of uh, Moses and his faith. Uh, it's helpful to see that um, the first mention of faith in connection with Moses was actually not the faith of Moses, but the faith of his parents. The faith of his parents. So verse 23 says, By faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So there's an encouragement to parents. Now, of course, we know, uh, as has been said, God has no grandchildren. Each person has to find Christ for themselves, has to come to that personal step of faith. But the faith of Moses' parents uh, prepared the way for that uh, great servant of God and the work that he did in leading the people out of the land of Egypt. And so well, the, thing, the five things I want to speak on will be uh, very short, just a few minutes on each. Uh, first of all, we see in verse 24 uh, that Moses refused something. So people of faith sometimes have to refuse things. And then we find in verse uh, 25 that he chose something. So he made a choice. He made a selection. So he refused something, and he chose something. Verse 26, he regarded or considered, he weighed up the different options that he had, and he made a decision on the basis of that regard or that consideration. And then verse 27, we see he left Egypt. So he left something. And then in verse 28, he kept something. He kept the Passover. And that's the five things. He refused. He chose. He regarded. He left. And he kept so the life of faith is not a passive life. It's not uh, the situation where uh, we say, I've got faith, and it's personal and private and has no impact on anything. 
The faith in the life of Moses uh, was something which drove him and affected every area of his life. So in all these critical decisions in his life, all the steps that he took, some of which um, seemed to run counter to the way the circumstances were going, he did it by faith. So this great example of faith I have read tonight to be an encouragement to us as we, uh, like Moses, live by faith. And of course, it's interesting in this chapter, we sometimes think a bit that in the Old Testament, well, they sort of lived by the law, New Testament, the gospel has come, and we live in the grace of God. But actually, we see that everybody in the Old Testament who pleased God, everybody who's mentioned this chapter, from Abel, that's just after the Garden of Eden, uh, right through to uh, the closing books of the Old Testament, anybody who pleased God did so on the ground of their faith. So by works, our own works, we can never please God. But if we live by faith, uh, God is with us and helps us on life's journey as we confide in him. Firstly, faith in Christ for salvation, and then faith for that path, that life that we would live. So first of all, uh, Moses, when he had grown up, now remember the story that um, Pharaoh was uh, killing uh, all the uh, baby boys because there were too many um, Israelites in Egypt and his parents uh, took Moses and put him in this little basket and put it on the river which uh, would have been if you like a figure of death putting a baby in the water would have been like death but uh, his father had made it carefully and so it floated and it was found by Pharaoh's daughter and so that river which would have been you would have thought really death to the child, became the means of life, the means of preserving the entire people of God because God's hand was upon it. And that was the answering the faith of Moses' parents. Well, then Moses grew up in Pharaoh's palace and by faith, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he refused something. Now, sometimes Christians um, have a reputation for saying no. They're just saying no to everything. And they're sometimes... Maybe unwisely, we appear a little bit negative. But, you know, God has set us free, and uh, sometimes you have to refuse things. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Um, we remember that uh, when Jesus was here, uh, he came to his own, and his own received him not. And he came in grace and mercy, but actually he was crucified. And so we just have to understand that there is uh, a world of sin, which we were once part of, and God has rescued us. And sometimes, as we live in a society which is maybe not always sympathetic to the ways of God, that sometimes we have to say no. And so in a godless and a needy society, we have to say no. And so we're, we discover that it's not a question of uh, making ourselves odd or different or awkward, but sometimes the claims of Christ are such that he has called us apart to himself. He has called us, and by his grace, our sins have been forgiven. And so, uh, as we're called out, we're sent back in, and we're sent with a message of God's love. But you can understand that the effect of sin in the lives of our the people in our society, and on society in general, is such that it is driving people away from God, and we have to refuse things which would do that. And so, we live with an inner faith and a confidence in God, and sometimes things have to be refused, refused. Um, now, you have to explain that all the time. Maybe there's something that you can't do or a philosophy that you can't embrace or an ideology that is against the Bible, and you have to say, here's why. But all the time, we do it in grace, like our Savior. But he refused something. Now, what he actually refused in this case was interesting because he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So, you see, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly a bad thing that he refused. In fact, it was a position of very great privilege. And he said, I'm not going to be associated uh, with Pharaoh's household because by being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, I would be badged with that. And he says, I don't want to do that. I want to be distinctive. And the people of God are called on to be distinctive and to be living lives that reflect the goodness and the grace of God in a world uh, that has been disfigured by sin and sorrow. And so in this time when we live by faith, some things we have to refuse. Um, and he gave up that privileged position. But then he also made a choice. 
it says he chose, verse 25, he chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Now, I'm sure if you're a certain age, you will have heard uh, many messages on the temporary pleasures of sin. And it might sound a bit old-fashioned, but there's a bit of a truth in it. Well, not just a bit of a truth. There is a truth in it. First part of the truth is that there are pleasures of sin. So there are pleasures of sin. Uh, It can be enjoyable being at a distance from God, but it's for a short time, for a season. And so he chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God. He chose the hard route in life along with God's people. This is the ancient people, Israel, who at that time were captive in uh, Egypt. And he chose to enjoy that rather than enjoy uh, the pleasures. He chose to be ill-treated rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin, which were just for a short time. So some things in life are transient. Some things don't last. The things of God are eternal. They are eternal. And so they last forever. And uh, in taking that path, uh, we see here that it can bring about ill treatment. And many, many Christians in the world today are ill treated. We're not bad in this country. We're okay. Uh, Maybe we confront some apathy, but there's not much ill treatment. But there are people in the world today who are ill treated because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he chose to identify himself with the people who were being ill treated. Um, And that was a choice that he took in faith. By faith, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose. He took that step of faith. And so it's just helpful to understand that the choices that we make in life may appear to be unusual. That's an unusual choice. Pharaoh's palace, called Pharaoh's daughter, or ill-treated along with the people of God. What would you choose? What would you choose? Well, he chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin, which would only be for a short time, because God has an eternal destiny, and he's calling us to live lives today that uh, are um, in view of that great eternity of blessing. It's also helpful to see that uh, faith is a bit different from circumstances. Sometimes uh, there are a number of indicators in life that show us God's mind and God's will for us, and it's sometimes hard to design those but always we have to walk by faith because when the faith of Moses' parents caused him to end up in Pharaoh's palace and to preserve his life, Pharaoh's palace was a good place to be. But then when it came to the time when God was going to call his people out, Pharaoh's palace was not a good place to be. So if you're just guided by circumstances and nothing else, you might make the wrong decision. But here are decisions that are made by faith. And then verse 26, having refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, having chosen to be ill-treated with the people of God. He then did um, a great weighing up on the balances. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. He regarded or he considered disgrace or reproach for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Why? Because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now, we must have just before us as Christians all the time the fact that there is a future. There's a future. It's not just the here and now, but there's a future. And so he weighed up the present circumstances, reproach or disgrace um, for the sake of Christ, the sake of Messiah, for the sake of Christ. He said that's more valuable than the treasures of Egypt. Why? Because he was looking ahead to the reward. He weighed up the options. And uh, that word, um, disgrace, it's really a word that means defamation. So it's quite a strong word. And he had a value system. And the value system of the believer is quite different from the value system of the society in which we live. Or it should be. And here was a value system that he had. So uh, disgrace or reproach for the sake of Christ, more valuable than the treasures of Egypt. Because he was looking ahead. And so faith, uh, faith is not looking for um, all the, the good things to come in this life, because many Christians suffer great hardship, and he did here, because he was going to be ill-treated uh, along with the people of God, and he regarded his grace for the sake of Christ as a greater value. So let's weigh up in those decisions of life. Let's weigh up our value system and uh, see where, uh, where our, our values really lie, uh, because for the sake of 
Jesus, for the sake of Christ, uh, there are decisions that we make, um, and they might be odd in the eyes of other people, but they can be the right decisions for the path of faith. Well, then he left something. So um, he left Egypt. Now, Egypt, of course, was the place uh, where you remember uh, uh, Joseph had gone down to Egypt and there was a famine in the land and Jacob and his family had gone down to get fed and they had become a great nation. And so uh, when Joseph was there, Egypt was the place where life had been preserved. But then we read at the beginning of Exodus that a new king arose that knew not Joseph. And so it became a place of captivity and persecution and the people were in hardship. And so uh, God had come, the time had come for God to call his people out. And so it says that Moses was the great leader of the people. Uh, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. And of course, good to remember that Moses, the great leader, uh, we read in, in Numbers that uh, he was the meekest man on the earth, that Moses was a meek man. Now, meek doesn't mean weak. It means that he was humble, but he was confident of what God was doing. And so this was not a loud-mouthed, aggressive sort of man. He was meek. And Jesus himself is described as meek. And sometimes people, um, they cast uh, doubts on the children's hymn, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild. That's what he was. He was meek and mild. He was approachable. That was our Savior. And Moses is said to be weak, uh, meek, meek, not weak, but meek. And in that character, he was uh, like him who was to come, like our Lord Jesus Christ. And here was a man who had to appear before uh, Pharaoh, before the king. And we know that from Exodus that he was reluctant to do that. And he said, I'm not, not really able to speak. And he had many objections to doing that. He was, he was meek. He was humble. But by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. Now, of course, this is before the, uh, that, the time when he left. It was before uh, the Ten Commandments were given. And I believe that it's referring to the burning bush. Remember, Moses was passing the bush that was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And he turned aside to look at it. And God spoke to him from the burning bush and revealed himself to him as the great savior of Israel. And it says that he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. And so in our walk of faith, um, we sometimes have to leave things. And of course, it's a figure of the fact that if you take Egypt as a picture of this present evil world, to use the New Testament term, we're called to leave it. Not to leave it physically, not at all, but to leave it in the sense that we are called to our Savior to follow him as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a call. And so we're called to leave some things. And by faith, uh, he left Egypt. He wasn't afraid of the consequences because he persevered seeing him who is invisible. And so we see uh, Christ seated at the right hand of God, the eye of faith, and we're confident that that step that we take as we leave this present evil world is one that will bring blessing and uh, be good for our souls. And um, as you said at the outset, uh, none of us have seen the Lord physically, but by faith we take that step. And so he's coming a long way. So he has refused something. He has chosen ill treatment. He has weighed up his value system and he's regarded as grace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And now he's taking this step and he's leaving Egypt and he's not afraid of the king. And this is the life of faith. So what's it feel like to have faith uh, this week? Well, I think it's sometimes quite difficult and uh, sometimes I'm quite challenged. I am absolutely sure of saving faith. I am absolutely sure that I have faith in Christ as my saviour. But day to day, to have faith like Moses, it's sometimes quite challenging to take a step of faith and to trust God for what lies ahead. God has not shown us uh, the end from the beginning. He doesn't actually show us the future. He does in a big sense in Revelation, but he doesn't show us uh, the future of our lives. And I think it's a good thing. you like to know? I don't think I would. I think God says, I'll give you faith for each step. Each step I'll give you faith. And so you live by faith. And that's why we pray, because we confide in him and we trust in him. And then we see that in that great exodus from Egypt, verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. I've often thought of this amazing Passover night. And of course, um, as, we, as we have the communion service, we remember that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. But if you think of the, the step of faith that Moses took, the, uh, the plagues had come in Egypt and uh, Pharaoh's heart had been hardened and he wasn't going to let the people go. 
And God spoke to Moses and said, well, here's the last, here's the last plague, if you like. And he said, you must take a lamb, have it in the house for 14 days. You must kill it. Uh, you must eat it. It must be roasted with fire. You must have it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And uh, when you take the Passover, you have to have shoes on your feet and your garments uh, gathered up, ready for the journey. And so they ate the Passover as a people who were about to move out. And when they killed the lamb, and here's the most remarkable thing, and they did this by faith, God said, you must take the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintel above the door. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? I think that if anybody in Egypt had done that and put the blood, I think God would have passed over. Because he didn't look inside the house. He just looked for the blood. And it seems an incredible thing to do that that simple act of putting the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, that symbolic act was sufficient for God to say, those people have got faith and are going to pass over that house. There'll be no judgment there. And so it may seem incredible to our workmates and our neighbors. We say, well, simply it is this, that I am a sinner and we're all sinners and God must punish sin. But instead of punishing us, he has punished his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as our substitute and his blood has been shed and God has said he is satisfied with the death of Jesus as the sacrifice for sin because when he hung on the cross God laid his sin our sins on him and he bore them and he has taken the judgment of God against sin now that might seem incredible but it's true and it's God's means of salvation and so we see that Moses by faith by faith now looking back of course you could see yes after the event I do see that God moved through the land and that the firstborn in every house without the blood was killed. But he didn't know that beforehand. So by faith, they did it. They did exactly what they were told to do. They took the lamb, they killed it. They put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. And they destroyed the firstborn, didn't touch the firstborn of Israel. And so that night, that night, of course, the great, the great fear was not the, the anger of Pharaoh, but it was the judgment of God. So it wasn't Pharaoh that was the, the great um, problem on the night of the Passover, but rather it was the judgment of God. And then the next day, as we read in the, verse, the following verse that we didn't read, that they went to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh was after them, and uh, they passed through the Red Sea because the waters were a wall to them on each side. And as the Egyptians tried to enter and cross over to pursue after the Israelites, the sea closed over and they were drowned. And the power of the enemy, the power of Pharaoh was broken. And so we have the Passover that uh, the blood saved them from the judgment of God. And in the Red Sea, another figure, I think, of the death of Christ, the power of the enemy was broken. Now, that's a people uh, in the Old Testament, and for us today, it's true, that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We've been set free from our sins. And the power of the enemy, uh, the power of uh, Satan has been broken in the death of Christ and have been set free. And we're set free to walk a path of faith. And so may God help us in this week that lies ahead. Maybe tomorrow you'll be challenged by something. Well, maybe sometimes you have to refuse something. And every day in the path of faith, we have to make a choice. We have to choose things. And it's not always a choice that would be the common sense thing to do because he chose to be ill-treated rather than the pleasures of sin. And sometimes we need a value system. We've got to weigh things up. He regarded his grace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And sometimes we've got to leave things. He left Egypt, not fearing the consequences, but he persevered because he saw him was invisible. And then he kept something. He kept the Passover. So he followed uh, the instructions that God had given him and what blessing followed in the path of faith. And the key thing about faith is that it is faith. It's not sight. So you've got to take the step in faith. And you have to trust God for each step. May God help us this week as we encourage one another on the path of faith. And let's just look for that day when faith gives place to sight and we'll see Jesus. Not in the distance, but face to face. Face to face. And when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for these Old Testament stories which uh, remind us of the path of faith that we as Christians are walking. Help us to live lives that depend on you for everything. We thank you that you haven't shown us uh, the future 
events in our own lives, but you've asked us to live by faith. You've asked us to confide in you. And so we take encouragement from the story of Moses, a man who took great steps, but took them all in faith. And we thank you, our Father, that you, the God of Moses, are the same today, and you call us uh, to trust in you and trust in you with every detail of our lives. We thank you that we trust you for salvation. By faith, uh, we have come and confessed our sins, uh, and we have the assurance in our souls that it is well with our souls, that our sins are gone, and that we are made fit for heaven, not by our own good deeds, but by what Jesus has done. And having begun in faith, we would seek to continue in faith and not to be made perfect by any other way, and so help us to walk uh, this night and tomorrow and Tuesday and throughout the week in the path of faith that pleases you. Our Father, sometimes uh, life's trials um, challenge us and test us. Give us then faith for the path we ask and cause that we might be seen as a people who are walking not by sight but by faith. And help us to remember that at the end of faith's journey, uh, when Jesus comes again, uh, we shall see him and faith will give place to sight. So bless us, we pray, and bless this consideration of the life of Moses to our souls. And separate us now with your blessing, in your fear and in your favour, we pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen.